Hello and welcome to today's WorkSafe Month webinar, Developing Managers' Capabilities in Supporting Workplace Mental Health, Looking After Your Workers, Looking After Yourself. I'm Stephanie Murawski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, please take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I will now go over housekeeping. Here is a screenshot of the attendee control panel. You should see something that looks like this on the right hand of your screen. You're likely listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Webcams and audience microphones will not be used in today's webinar. Questions will be taken at the end of today's presentation. Please use the questions pane on your control panel to type and submit your questions at the time. A worksheet for today's presentation was also emailed prior to attendees. This will be referred to during the presentation. If you did not receive the worksheet, you can download it now from your GoToWebinar handouts pane. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Dr. Megan Woods, Senior Lecturer in Management at the University of Tasmania. Megan is a founding member of the Workplace Mental Health Research Group and the Work Health and Wellbeing Network at the University of Tasmania. She is passionate about helping individuals, managers and organisations develop their capabilities in supporting mental health in workplace settings. She has over 10 years experience in researching, teaching and consulting work, examining topics including how managers can use workplace conditions to support employees with depression, how ma managerial behaviour affects li liability for workers' compensation related to psychological injury, and how supervisors can best support employees returning to work from psych psychological injury. Welcome, Megan. Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making the time to be here today. I hope you enjoy the session and find it useful. So as Stephanie said, I'm a senior lecturer in management and a member of the Workplace Mental Health Research Group at the University of Tasmania. Uh, and for the last decade, I've been doing a variety of work in this space with the wonderful colleagues that you see featured on this slide. My particular focus in this space is helping managers and organisations develop capabilities in supporting workplace mental health and specifically to help create work and study environments that are at least supportive of mental health but ideally also positively impacting mental health as well. So in today's session, I'll start by with reviewing with you some of the reasons why managers and organisations need capabilities in supporting workplace mental health. And then I'm going to talk more specifically about the capabilities that managers need to support employees that are experiencing stress and burnout. Part of that will be focusing specifically on how various aspects of the work environment influence stress and burnout and therefore how those components can be adapted to address stress and burnout if it is occurring and hopefully prevent it from occurring in the future. So I'll, today I'll be examining with you some ways in which you can do that for your employees, but also ways in which you can do that for yourself. So I'll be encouraging you to think about uh, how the conditions that I'm talking about might be affecting your staff, but also how they might be affecting you so that you can also get some ideas for ways in which you might be able to adapt the conditions in which you're working. And I'll finish by also talking about some additional strategies you can use to protect yourself while you are supporting employees that are experiencing mental health issues related to burnout. So in the context of today's discussion, when I talk about mental health, I'm talking about the whole scope of states of wellbeing that relate to our capacity to deal with the normal stresses of life, be able to work, be able to make contributions to our community and to be able to sustain relationships with family and friends. I prefer to use the term mental health issues rather than mental health problems because it's less stigmatising. And when I use that term, I mean both mental illnesses and also experiences of mental ill health, such as those related to stress. So before I go on, I'm going to invite you to take a moment to consider 
why you need uh, capabilities in supporting mental health in your workplace. Put another way, why are you here today? Why did you think it was worth taking some time to dedicate to? If you have the worksheet that was circulated with this presentation, by all means, use that to take some notes. Um, but otherwise, just take a moment to think about where that motivation has come from in your life. Perhaps you have had experience of supporting employees in this way, or perhaps you've observed employees experiencing mental health issues or stress related issues, and you've decided this is an area that you'd like to build your capabilities and confidence in. So many of you have probably noted that one of the reasons this is important is because of the prevalence of mental health issues in today's societies. Later statistics from Beyond Blue indicate that 3 million Australians, one in five of us, have depression or anxiety. Every day, eight Australians die by suicide. Worldwide, depression is the leading cause of disability and is estimated to cost over a trillion dollars in lost productivity. From a workers' compensation point of view, over 90% of claims for workers' compensation uh, that involve mental health conditions relate to work stress. So, put simply, um, people are experiencing mental health issues in workplaces every day, whether those are mental health issues that arise from their workplace or mental health issues that arise from other causes in their life. We bring it through the door with us, whether we are coming into work as a physical place or a mental space. So it's part of our work environment, um, whether or not we can see it or whether or not we're aware that it's there. Legally, managers and organisations also have responsibilities for supporting mental health in the workplace. And that includes legal responsibilities to provide a safe and healthy workplace that doesn't cause or aggravate mental health conditions ensuring that people who have mental health conditions receive equal employment opportunities, have their confidentiality and privacy protected, and receive reasonable adjustments and accommodations to perform their job, just like people who have physical health issues. In Australia, employers are also liable to pay workers' compensation for a psychological injury that's incurred or exacerbated by the work environment, unless, the worker did not disclose the condition that they later claim was exacerbated by their work, or the injury results from what's called reasonable management action. So given all of this, what capabilities do to support workplace mental health do managers need? Well, in our research that examined what managers experience when they are supporting employees with depression and burnout, we found that amongst other things, managers need to be capable of understanding when a mental health issue might be in play, understanding how the mental health issue and the work environment are interacting with each other, and then also understanding how workplace conditions can be adapted to provide those reasonable accommodations for people who are experiencing a mental issue, and also to improve the psychological safety of the workplace. So today I'm going to focus specifically on helping you develop your capabilities in this space by first helping you understand when stress and burnout might be in play in your work environment and then by applying the framework of the psychosocial work environment I'm going to help you understand how specific workplace conditions can cause stress and burnout to occur and how those workplace conditions can be adapted to improve support for stress and burnout and improve psychological safety. So this will help you develop strategies that you can use to support both your employees and yourself in your work environment. And by the end of this session, not only will you understand how to do these things, you'll also understand how to follow best practice recommendations and take an integrated approach to supporting workplace mental health that prevents psychological harm, promotes positive states of mental wellbeing and supports the management of mental illness. As I'll explain, the conditions that I'll be focusing on today have been empirically demonstrated to have both positive and negative impacts on mental wellbeing and specifically on stress and burnout. So what I'll be discussing with you today is how you can manage those conditions so as to hopefully maximise the positive impacts and minimise the negative ones. So let's begin by discussing stress and burnout. In the context of today's discussion, when I'm talking about stress, I'm referring specifically to workplace stress, which causes negative responses to workplace demands and can, over time, contribute to psychological injury. 
One of the problems with workplace stress is that it creates a vicious cycle with fatigue. The ongoing demands of dealing with stressors reduce people's energy and cognitive function while also increasing emotional sensitivity. The longer this goes on, the more fatigued people become, which then reduces their resilience and their ability to cope with stress. That means that ongoing exposure to stresses has greater impact over time and people feel increasingly helpless about their ability to deal with those stresses and get on top of them. Over time, prolonged response to, job, to chronic job stresses causes burnout. Now, burnout is not a clinical or diagnosable mental illness. The concept was developed in the 1970s to describe states of being observed in healthcare workers. And there are three components to it. The first is exhaustion, physical, emotional depletion, feeling run out, that feeling like you've just got an empty tank and there, there isn't any charge left on the battery. The second component is feeling detached uh, from your workplace and colleagues and feeling either negative, callous, or even angry towards the people you're actually trying to help. So when we hear service providers like teachers talking about those annoying students or healthcare workers talk about those annoying patients, particularly people who are normally very focused on the well-being of the people that they're trying to serve and help, that can be a, a very strong indicator that burnout's in play. The third component is feelings of reduced efficacy. So feeling like you're not being productive, you're not accomplishing anything, like there's no point trying anymore. That real feeling of the hamster stuck in the hamster wheel, going round and round, but not really getting anywhere. Some of the ways in which burnout can affect people's uh, work environment and relationship with their work and workplace include social, physical and emotional withdrawal from the workplace, being less productive and effective, experiencing lower job satisfaction and reduced commitment to work, and workplace conflict. In addition, job burnout has spillover effects to both other colleagues in the workplace. So if some people are experiencing burnout, that can then cause uh, contribute to other people generating burnout over time, and also spillover effects to people's home lives. So just like you to take a moment now to reflect upon a time when you felt really burned out, perhaps because of work demands or perhaps because of other demands in your life. Just think for a moment about what signs you had that that was happening for you. Or if you've seen somebody around you experiencing burnout recently, how did you know what signs were, were um, red flagging for you to say, I think there might be a problem here? Now, when people are burned out, this can show itself in the workplace in a number of ways. It can be through experiences of chronic fatigue and feeling physically depleted. You know, people are tired all the time. They have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. They're generally slower in doing things than they would be because of reduced energy levels. It can be through impaired concentration, lowering their ability to focus um, and stay on top of things. It can be because they become tense and edgy, because they become anxious, um, all of which might affect their ability to function in their role. All of these things can also, in addition, contribute to tension and irritability towards other people, perhaps even manifesting um, as testiness or anger towards coworkers and clients. It can also be evidenced by people losing enjoyment in their work and their workplace, not enjoying the aspects of the work that they used to becoming pessimistic, becoming cynical, um, and perhaps even feeling apathetic and hopeless. All of these affect productivity and performance, but again, these are all indicators which might be caused by a number of different factors. So, and in fact, many of them are also potential indicators of depression. So if you're starting to see signs like this in the people around you, it may well be time to stop and have a conversation about what's going on. Now, stress and burnout are both influenced by what we call the psychosocial work environment, which Segrist and Marmont defined as the range of opportunities that are provided by the workplace 
to meet a person's needs for wellbeing, productivity and positive self-experience. Specifically, this theory says that whether the work environment has positive or negative impacts on people's wellbeing and productivity depends on whether the psychosocial work environment is supportive or stressful. Whether it is supportive or stressful depends upon whether it provides opportunities to experience self-efficacy and self-esteem. Those opportunities are influenced in turn by five specific conditions. How cognitively demanding the job and the work environment are, how much discretionary control people have over how they do their work, how much social support they receive in their work environment, the overall level of efforts that are demanded and the rewards that they receive for those efforts. Put another way, the psychosocial work environment says that whether a work environment has positive or negative impacts on people's wellbeing and productivity depends upon the extent to which these five conditions create opportunities to feel valued and valuable. That means that when work environments create opportunities to feel valued and valuable, people experience a positive environment with positive impacts on their wellbeing and productivity. When their working environment presents fewer opportunities for them to feel valued and valuable, they experience a stressful psychosocial environment which negatively impacts their wellbeing and productivity. Now, if we take a moment to apply the lens of the psychosocial work environment to our experiences in 2020, we can see that in many respects, this year has created a perfect storm of conditions for stress and burnout. The challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic have imposed high levels of cognitive demand, while at the same time lowered our levels of, con of job control uh, and, and reduced a lot of discretionary control in not just how we do our work, but where we do our work uh, and the conditions that we are trying to manage as we do that. We've also lowered the degrees of social support we receive from our work environment by dis disconnecting us from those around us, especially our colleagues and workmates. All of this has combined to increase the overall lef levels of efforts that um, are demanded from us or required from us to get our work done without commensurate increase in rewards. So as I said, in many respects, actually a perfect storm of conditions designed to create stress and burnout. Although it is encouraging to see how much as touch, attention and discussion this has gotten over the course of this year, and we can only hope it will continue. So in a work environment, how then do we improve the situation? Which are the conditions and adaptations that we can focus on to help people who are experiencing stress and burnout and hopefully reduce the incidences of those in the future. In summary, by focusing on the eight workplace conditions that are listed on this slide and which I'm about to talk you through in more detail. These were originally proposed by Leder and Maslach in what is now one of the classic readings in this area. And it's those original conceptualizations that I've drawn on today to help you understand what these conditions are and how they might manifest in your workplace. They've also since uh, been empirically demonstrated to impact elements of burnout and one or more of the five conditions of the psychosocial work environment. But I've not included the details for all that literature as the slides would be overwhelming. My point is that these are the conditions are the ones that we can improve, not only to reduce the potential for them to generate burnout or to contribute to psychological risks of burnout, but also to directly enhance people's opportunities to experience self-efficacy, self-esteem, feel more valued, feel more valuable in their work environment. So as I talk through them, I encourage you to use your worksheet to think about and note down ways in which you could improve these conditions for your employees but also how you could potentially improve them for yourself. Prevention is always better than cure. So if you're able to see any opportunities to improve these conditions and improve your own psychosocial work environment as well, then so much the better. So the first condition I'm going to focus on is increasing feedback from supervisors. Feedback from supervisors and support from peers influence people's experience of burnout, both experience people's um, burnout but feedback from supervisors is the more powerful of the two. If you're unable to change any of the other conditions that I talk about today, at least focus on this one. 
feedback from supervisors is negatively associated with emotional exhaustion. And by providing feedback to your staff, you'll be increasing their levels of social support that they experience in their work environment and also increasing the intrinsic rewards they receive for the work they do. So take a second to think about some strategies that you could do to use to provide more feedback to your staff about what they're doing and how well they're doing it. There are two main areas of feedback that you could focus on here. The first is signaling to employees that you see what they're doing and you understand what they're dealing with. You understand the challenging context in which they're operating and you understand that it's taking new and different levels of effort to accomplish what they're accomplishing in the current environment. Another strategy here would be to give them more feedback about what they are accomplishing so as to help reassure them that you know what they're doing, you appreciate the efforts that they're making, you value what they're achieving and you see their contributions as being valuable. A second condition is to find ways to reduce role ambiguity, role conflict and values conflict in your work environment. All three of these elements contribute to burnout by requiring employees to use time and energy uh, that they would otherwise use to deal with work demands or in addition to what they're uh, using to deal with work demands. And this contributes to burnout by causing exhaustion and depersonalization. So by reducing these elements, you're freeing up time and energy that people can use to stem that depletion, refocus on their work, and rebuild their emotional and psychological resources. So when I'm talking about reducing role conflict and role ambiguity, I'm really just talking about taking out the guesswork, eliminating the need for people to spend time and energy second guessing what's important and what they should prioritise. So strategies that you could use here can really include anything that you can do to help clarify to people how they ought to prioritise and resolve competing demands for their time and attention, what tasks do need 100% effort and which ones just need to get done but don't need to be aced. In the circumstances, when circumstances are as fluid as they are this year, it's important to also help people understand whether they should still be trying to meet the priorities that they previously would have done or where those priorities and expectations have changed. So even saying th things to them like, for the next two weeks, I just want you to focus on this or for the next month, we're just gonna focus on achieving this and we'll deal with the rest later. Even that kind of feedback, um, that kind of clarity can help people redefine where they should be directing their energy and know how they can conserve those resources. Another way to help is by improving workloads. And by that, I don't necessarily mean uh, reducing people's workload, although of course that's helpful if it can be done, but rather reducing the mismatches between the workload that they have and the resources and capabilities that they have to do it. For instance, if there are mismatches between the tasks that they're doing and the skills that they have, then that's going to increase the level of effort that's demanded of them to do that role. Even simple things like using new workplace technologies can be difficult if they don't have sufficient training and resources to help them do that. So ensuring that they have that support or checking whether they need any additional support with that is another way to both help improve those mismatches but also help them feel more supported and understood. If the work environment requires them to display certain types of emotional state and those don't fit or align with how they're actually feeling, then the workload associated with doing that kind of emotional labour can also be hidden, but very demanding. Additionally, when people are working non-standard hours, such as evenings and weekends, then there's a hidden workload associated with managing those kinds of schedules and the additional workload of uh, providing support and getting work done without access to social supports and other resources that would be available if they were working more standard schedules. So what strategies can you use to help identify and improve these mismatches? One strategy might include talking with employees about what it's taking for them to do their jobs these days. For instance, if they've been working from home with a partner who's also doing so and kids that are home from school and normal activities, then the total workload required to be able to perform their work duties in that setting 
is much higher than it would have been if they were in their regular workplace. So having these conversations again helps people feel seen and understood, helps to reassure them that you understand what it's taking for them to do their jobs and you're aware that they are making all kinds of additional investments to still be able to fulfil their workplace functions. Other strategies can include giving people support to manage the emotional labour component of their job. For instance, many of us are spending a lot of time in Zoom calls these days. Spending a lot of time up close and personal with a web camera can actually make people feel quite vulnerable and exposed, both personally and because in that context, again, particularly if they're at home, they are, it is making it possible for people to see a whole lot of elements of their personal life and private life that they don't normally share with work colleagues. And again, that can make people feel vulnerable and exposed. So even establishing team norms like it's okay to have your camera turned off, no one will mind if you do, can make it just that little bit easier for people to manage some of those demands and give them back more control. Speaking of control, another way we can help is to help people improve the degree of discretionary control they have over the way they do their job. This might be more control over what's done, how it's done, or the way they schedule their time to get it done. Now, your first thoughts here might be that giving people more control and discretion over how they do their work is in fact actually making their work more cognitively demanding if they now have to make more decisions for themselves about how they do things, but that isn't necessarily the case. One of the simplest strategies you can do here is to confer with your employees and say, tell me one thing that's holding you back from being able to be more effective in your role. Just one thing and see what they say. They probably already know and they can probably already articulate quite clearly how they would be better off if that one thing was able to be changed. So if you can find ways to reduce or remove those barriers, then again, not only are you going to help your employees feel like they have more control, but they're also going to feel more, more productive, more accomplished and more supported. Now reward mismatches relate specifically to the effort reward imbalance I mentioned earlier. So identifying ways to help provide more rewards to employees for the efforts that they make and for what they accomplish is gonna help on a number of fronts. Now you might be thinking in the current environment, organisations can't really increase financial rewards, but according to the theory of the psychosocial work environment, those aren't the ones that we would necessarily focus on. In fact, social rewards and intrinsic rewards will have more impact because if, for instance, you can increase the recognition that employees receive for their efforts and their accomplishments, then not only is that going to improve their social support that they receive, but also helps to build their sense of accomplishment, their pride in their work and their self-efficacy. So just take a moment to think about what you could do to help your employees feel more appreciated and more recognised for what they're accomplishing in their work. One strategy might be encouraging people to keep a bullet journal and even keeping one yourself. A bullet journal simply requires that you take a couple of minutes to do a lightning list, four or five bullet points. What did I accomplish today? I did this and this and this and this. The practice of keeping a bullet journal causes people to stop and reflect and check in each day on what they've accomplished. Focusing on how many things that you've crossed off your to-do list um, can also help, but the problem with that is it also tends to focus your attention on the things that didn't get crossed off. So it can be a bit counterproductive in helping you feel like you've really accomplished much. A bullet journal just focuses attention on what you did accomplish and the wins that you did have and this helps to build productive sense of productivity and efficacy. Another strategy might be that when you have team meetings, do a lightning round and ask everybody on the team to nominate the thing they're most proud of accomplishing this week. Doesn't necessarily have to be a work accomplishment, could be anything at all, but just give them a moment to express that and share that with the team and celebrate that together. That will help people feel accomplished for what, acknowledged for what they are accomplishing, but it will also give you a better sense of what's meaningful to them and an opportunity for them to link their work selves to their personal values and be their authentic selves in a work context. 
And last but not least, focus on helping your employees to strengthen their positive connections to other people in their workplace and rebuild their sense of community. Social and physical distancing of workplaces this year has had a lot of different impacts on our sense of connection or our colleagues. Some of those are counterintuitive. So anecdotal evidence has emerged this year that in fact for some people it's been positive because working outside their normal work environment has strengthened their sense of community by reducing their exposure to colleagues whom they normally find irritating and have conflict with. But another impact of physical and social distancing is that when we do experience those, those little points of tension and irritation and conflict that arise in day-to-day -day interactions with other employees, we don't have the same opportunities to address them and smooth them over. So providing ways to do that is important, but may take a little bit of creative thinking. Some strategies that can be helpful here can include, can help people reconnect by setting up a buddy system. So they're not necessarily having to reconnect with everyone at once, they do it uh, in a more piecemeal fashion. And another strategy is to help people connect um, by sharing their experiences. For instance, the Harvard Business Review recently published an excellent article on storytelling as a way of sharing both traumatic stress experiences that they may have had this year, but also growth experiences, the positive things, the good things that have come out of these challenging circumstances, the realisations and insights that people have had about new areas of strength and new capabilities that they've developed out of these challenging times. Again, this type of connecting can be beneficial for helping people feel acknowledged for what they've experienced and the efforts that it's taken to get those ex through those experiences on many different fronts. So let's finish now by focusing on what you might encounter when you are helping the employee who is experiencing stress or burnout. And by helping, I mean you're supporting, uh, working through with them how this is affecting their capacity to do their job, what supports and accommodations can be put in place for them and how you can support them as a manager. So I'd like to finish up now by talking about some strategies that you can use as you are supporting them through those processes. First and arguably most important is encouraging your employees to use professional supports. When we've interviewed managers who are supporting employees with mental health issues, one of the concerns we most frequently hear is, I can't do this, I don't have clinical knowledge in this space, I'm not a psychologist. But that's okay, because no one actually expects you to be. If you think about it for a sec, if one of your employees turned up at work with an injured leg, no one would expect you to be able to diagnose what's wrong with it and come up with a treatment plan. That's not your job, that's not your role. Similarly, if somebody turns up at work experiencing mental ill health, no one expects you to determine if they have a mental illness. All you are expected to do is find out whether somebody else is providing professional or clinical support. Have they talked to their GP? Have they talked to a counsellor? And if not, encourage them to do so. This might include talking to their GP, getting access to a mental health plan so they can get access to free support from a psychologist, or it might be professional support provided through a counsellor or your organisation's employee assistance program if you have one. Secondly, find out what supports are available for you. Talk to people in your HR department, find out what kind of advice they can support, they can provide for you. Find out what relevant policies and procedures say you can and can't do in terms of the support that you can provide for your employees and the adaptations you can make. Use those to support your decision processes. If your organisation has an employee assistance provider, get access to it so that you've got an opportunity to get support for any aspects of this process that are stressful for you. External support such as resources and toolkits provided by Beyond Blue are also worth looking into. And finally, as you go through the process of supporting an employee, particularly if it's an ongoing situation, create opportunities to debrief in an appropriate and confidential manner. Of course, you have to protect the employee's privacy. You can't mention their name or any details that might make them identifiable. But it's important to ensure that you've got access to somebody appropriate, such as someone in HR or an employee assistance provider, who can then support you as you work your way through this process. Finally, make sure that your, super, your supervisor is in the loop and they know that your work responsibilities are currently including supporting employees with a stress or burnout related issue. This is to ensure that this doesn't become a hidden part of your workload 
and that your boss is aware that this is also potentially a source of stress for you. Be very clear with yourself and your staff members about what assistance you can and cannot offer. For instance, what accommodations you have the authority to implement uh, versus those that would need to be signed off by other people. Also, the extent to which you're prepared to be personally available. And that might be as simple as setting a boundary that says you're available to talk to this person and support them during work hours, but if they need someone to talk to outside of work hours, that needs to be somebody else. Take time to also establish your canaries, your indicators that tell you when a situation might be coming untenable. What will be your early warning signs that supporting this employee is becoming too difficult or too challenging and that you might need to bring additional support into the situation or even hand it over to someone else? And finally, increase your own self-care to make sure that you replenish the energies that you're putting into supporting your employee and you're recharging your own batteries as well. This might include things like scheduling more time for exercise or more opportunities to go for a walk and clear your head, time when your phone is turned off so you don't have other demands on your, your attention and emotional resources, and creating quiet time to recharge or do things with friends and family to rebalance your emotional energies. So I hope today's session has given you uh, some thought provoking ideas for strategies you can use to support your employees and yourself. Um, I'll now hand back over to Stephanie for questions. All right, thank you, Megan. So Megan has also put some references here on her slides as well. And just to remind everyone that uh, this webinar um, is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our YouTube page after WorkSafe Month. Also to remind everyone that uh, there is the worksheet available as well. If you haven't, if you didn't receive it prior to the session, if you hadn't had a, have a chance to download it, um, there's still the opportunity now to do so. So question that has come through, oh, again, it's about the recording and, and, and circulation of the webinar. Um, so again, yes, it has been recorded and will be made available on our YouTube uh, site. Any questions that you have, please type them in to the questions pane on your control panel. As well, to remind everyone that it is Mental Health Week this week, so as well as the session that has been provided by Dr Megan Woods today from the University of Tasmania, we have other mental health and wellbeing webinars happening this week during WorkSafe Month, as well as uh, throughout the month as well. So please do head to the WorkSafe TAS Month website and uh, have a look at what other webinars we are running. So just a comment that has come through, Megan. Um, so thank you for the, for the great session. I feel empowered to talk to my staff around mental health. Oh, that's really lovely to hear. And look, I'm more than happy for people, if people want to use the recording of today's session as a conversation starter with their staff um, and use, use some of these as talking points to ask questions and check in with staff on areas that they might like more support with, um, please do so. I'd be delighted if you're able to use it in that way and use it as a conversation framer. Thanks, Megan. As well, at the end of today's session, a you will receive a, a survey about the presentation. So we do appreciate uh, you completing that survey, providing us with your feedback. It, it certainly helps us when we're framing WorkSafe Month each each year to know what, what you want um, so that we can uh, deliver that information to you. A question that has come through, Megan, I'm just wondering what tips you have on mental health conversation starters with the male employees who might be hesitant to open up? Oh, absolutely. So um, in my team, we actually have a little conversational tool that we've developed over time called the 30 second check-in. So if, for instance, we see somebody come into the workplace in the morning who's not looking like their usual self, you know, maybe they haven't said hi to people, maybe they seem a bit preoccupied, a bit flat, a bit down, you know, all of those little indicators that make you think there's something not right with Megan today. Um, we do what's called a 30 second check-in. So that means somebody in the team will then 
for instance, follow that person, go to that person's office or create another opportunity to talk to them alone and say, hi, I'm just doing a 30 second check in to see how you're doing today because I noticed that when you came in, um, you didn't say hi and you didn't make eye contact like you normally do. And I'm just wondering if everything's okay or if there's anything you need some help with. And in our team, it's the norms are that you can say, uh, no, it's okay, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm just tired or I was thinking of something else or actually I'm not okay, but I don't want to talk about that right now or no, I'm not okay, and yes, I would like a chance to talk. So that's our little conversation opener to just say, this is what I've noticed, and I'm just wondering, you know, is there anything you'd like to talk about? And if people say, no, I, I, there's not, or no, I don't want to talk right now, I can't talk right now, then we just say, okay, well, look, if that changes at all, you know where to find me, happy to talk anytime. Because one of the really important things to remember about opening conversations with mental health is it's about opening the door in the first place. People aren't necessarily going to go through it right now, but if you can just gently signal to them that the door is open and they can either walk through it now or some other time, then go right ahead. Um, it's important to set that precedent. And similarly, if, if, you, if you've got a strong sense that there's something wrong, and people aren't responsive to talking about that right now, that's okay too. They may literally not be able to do that right now, particularly if they are struggling with things. But it's also okay to check back in with them later on. So for instance, if you've, you've spoken to them first thing in the day and then you see them later on in the day and you go, oh, you know, you're, you're looking like you've got a little bit more energy now or for you're still looking a little bit flat. Are you, are you sure you're okay? I'm not meaning to hassle you. I'm just checking in because I'm concerned about how you might be. One of the most important things to stress here is make sure you have that conversation in a private space. Okay, that's not a conversation to open uh, as you're both standing by the kettle in the tea room in a space that anybody else could walk into at any time. So it's important to think about where you have that conversation. Um, and it's also okay, you know, if you if you weren't able to have that conversation today, you can have it tomorrow. You can say, look, I just noticed yesterday when you came in, you, you weren't your normal bubbly self. Um, just checking to see if you're all right. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Beyond Blue also have a number of excellent resources available here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Are You OK initiatives, but they've recently done some extension pieces on that to say beyond Are You OK. So if you say to someone, are you OK? And they say no, what do you, you know, where do you take the conversation after that? So those are definitely worth having a look at as well. Um, and other, in, other resources such as from the Black Dog Institute, or SANE, um, Mental Health First Aid Australia, all have excellent resources available as well. All right, thanks, Megan. There's still time to submit questions via your questions pane uh, for Megan to, to answer. Uh, a question, Megan, do you have any tips on getting management to listen to workers' concerns about mental health issues and burnout? That's a good one. Um, I guess firstly the question, where, where is the conversation at? Um, for instance, if this is not an issue that's been raised with them before, then I'd suggest framing it, um, perhaps framing it in the way that I framed the beginning of this session to say, these are issues that have become apparent that are affecting people's capacity to do their jobs, um, people's opportunity to, to do their jobs productively. So can we have a talk about them? If there are, issues that are, so if your sense is that the conversations aren't happening because managers aren't aware, then it may be a question of bringing it to their attention. And in that respect, we can kind of piggyback on COVID a little bit here because there's an opportunity to say, look, these are exceptional times. These are exceptional circumstances. People are dealing with stuff they've never dealt with before. Let's use this as an opportunity to check in with them and say, how are you doing? What do you need? Is there any any particular support that you need right now? Any changes we can make to make it easier to deal with these, you know, these amazing circumstances that we're in? So that can be helpful if you've got managers who are in that mindset of, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this work environment. There's no particular issues in play here. You can say, well, there are issues in play. They're not issues of our creating, but they are in play and we need to do something about that. 
Another way you can do that is um, what we call support by stealth. So if it's possible for you as colleagues and co-workers to start having those conversations about those changes and start implementing those on an informal level, such as reaching out to each other, providing more support, um, and or if you as a supervisor have some degree of um, discretion to make some of those changes to people's work conditions, then you can build an evidence base to go to the managers above you and say, so we've been making some changes in our area to help provide more support for employees to do their jobs and these are the benefits that this is generating and so now we'd like to talk about whether these can be implemented more broadly or whether we can take these further. All right, thanks Megan. So we've also had some comments come in. Again, thank you for the session. It's provided a lot of information to provoke thinking and perhaps some set suggestions to take to team meetings to build rapport with the team. A question though, as an employee, do you have any ideas on how to suggest some of these management ideas with managers if you see a gap or an area that could be improved? I guess it depends um, on what you're taking it to the manager for. So if you're seeing that there's a way that this could be improved for you and the people in your team, then perhaps you can open that conversation with your manager by saying, so for instance, um, did some webinars as part of the Safe Work Month, learnt some interesting ideas, would like a chance to implement them in our team, if we can have support to do that, please, um, and see if they're open to that. If there are particular initiatives that you feel really strongly about and you've got the capacity to take that on, don't overload yourself of course, but maybe the, the conversation piece can be going to your manager to say, look, um, there's an initiative here that I really believe in that I'd really like to take forward. Can I have your permission to do that or can I have your permission to talk to the team about whether we can take that forward as a team? Because generally speaking, if you, if you can make um, the, the path to yes, the path of least resistance, you may be more likely to get a yes. So if you can already spell out for them what you want to do and how you want them to do it and all you really need them to do is sign off on that, then that's great. If you need other supports in place, then again, framing that in terms of the benefits that are likely to result from that, particularly if you can make it clear to them that there's going to be um, minimal impact on the organisation in terms of requiring additional resources and support to make that happen, then that will also hopefully help them to do that as well. Organisations like Beyond Blue also provide um, a number of case studies about organisations that have tried different approaches and managers that have tried different approaches and what benefits have come from that. So you might also be able to use those to demonstrate to your workplace uh, what benefits might be achievable if you are supported in this initiative. All right, thanks Megan. And a final question. We have a predominantly male working environment, significant reduction in use of EAP during COVID, but a significant increase in use of internal mental health first aiders. We think this is a good thing, but we could be missing something. Also, is this trend being noticed amongst other businesses or are others using more EAP? I don't have the data to know whether that, that pattern of usage um, is widespread at this time, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, we know, for instance, that in male dominated industries like mining and construction, mental health support programs like the Mates in Construction Suicide Prevention Program have been really successful because they rely on workplace connections. Um, so those programs use workplace champions, workplace support, so that people who are experiencing difficulties, whether that's because they're feeling suicidal or there's been a workplace suicide and they're needing support with dealing with feelings about that, they reach out to other people who are in the organisation on the work site and those people support them and help them access other forms of support. So if that's something that's already happening in your organisation, if you've already got staff that are reaching out through those internal networks and those internal supporters, that's fantastic. Um, and it's also something that you can encourage a bit further. So you might like to look into the Mates in Construction program, which has now been expanded into uh, mining as well. 
to have a look at the kind of models that they use. But I'd say there's also a great opportunity here to talk to your mental health first aiders and find out what kinds of issues are coming across their desks. What sort of things are people reaching out for support for? Um, and what kinds of support are they receiving? And then you can use that as an opportunity to start the conversation with the whole workforce to say, you know, we're aware, for instance, that across a lot of different industries, these things are happening. I wouldn't frame it in terms of the organisation that might make people feel scrutinised. But you can say, you know, we're aware that other organisations are doing this and we'd like to take the opportunity to see if we can improve our own practices here and see what people can get assistance with. The more important thing is that they get help. It's Some people don't like to use an EAP because they, they're concerned that whatever they talk to with that, that counsellor might be reported back to management, even though that's of course not what happens with an employee assistance provider. But I'd say the message to emphasise here is, if you need the help, get the help. Whether you reach out within the organisation or you reach out to people outside the organisation is not the, the important point here. The important point is that you reach out to somebody. Um, but if you can also normalise those conversations, like encourage people to talk about the fact that, oh yeah, I was feeling a bit stressed about that. So I reached out for some help and I found the counselling really good, helped me get through that difficult time. Then people may not acknowledge that that's what they're doing, but it will help to normalise it and feel like it's okay when they realise that other people have done this too. And also they realise that it's worth it, that reaching out does, does help. Um, at the very least, it helps people recognise that they're at the point where they can't deal with this on their own. Because as the saying goes, you don't wait till you're cold to put your coat on, you put your coat on so you don't get so cold. So if you can normalise the idea of if you think you could do with a little bit of help or you might benefit from some reach out now, you know, don't wait until it feels critical, do it earlier rather than later, then that can also to help to normalise those practices as well. All right, thanks, Megan. Just a final question that has come through. Do you recommend any survey tools to see where the workplace is at, is at as a whole? Yes, in fact, there's a brilliant program that's been developed by some researchers in Canada called the Guarding Minds at Work program. It was developed around 2013. And it looks specifically at um, 13 different conditions in the workplace that organisations can focus on improving to address, you know, improve psychological safety. And one of the reasons I particularly like that program is that there's a raft of resources that they make available, including diagnostic questionnaires that you can distribute to your staff. So you can get a sense, an audit, if you will, on which of these conditions we're pretty good on right now and which are the ones that have some room for improvement. And then there's a whole raft of strategies that they provide information about to say, if this is the condition that you're focusing on, here are some ways in which you can improve that. And here are some indicators that you can look at to, de to determine whether you are in fact making improvements and moving forward on these dimensions. All right, thanks, Megan. So on that note, Thank you, Dr. Megan Woods, Senior Lecturer in Management at the University of Tasmania for your webinar today, Developing Managers' Capabilities in Supporting Workplace Mental Health, Looking After Your Workers, Looking After Yourself. Again, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We do appreciate your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded and will be made available at the end of WorkSafe Month. On behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and the Work Cover Tasmania Board, thank you for joining us and thank you, Megan. Thanks, Stephanie.